Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Uh, Sister Zainab uh, Zaidi, are you here? Brother Ahmed told me uh, you could uh, recite Quran. If you are here, feel free whenever you are ready. Assalamu alaikum. I'm here. Should I start? Yes, yes, yeah, whenever you're ready, you okay. can start. Thank you. Audhu billahi min ash shaitan ar rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. أرأيت الذي يكذب بالدين فذلك الذي يدوء اليتيم ولا يهض على طعام المسكين فويل للمصلين الذين هم عن صلاتهم ساهون الذين هم يراءون ويمنعون الماءون صدق الله الذي لازم Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for the beginning, uh, there was one video that we wanted to start. Uh, the video is a kind of Islamic rap style for a uh, narration about the, what happened in Karbala. That's about six minutes. After that, we will go for the free discussion or Q&A. So with your permission, I will uh, share my screen and start the video as a warm-up. Give me one second, sorry. Not the right one. Allow me to set the scene Fifty years have passed since Muhammad the messenger breathed his last His grandson Hassan also recently martyred Smell of poison still fresh from his grave Heart swayed like grass in the wind Following cinnamon Following bitter men like Yazid who in turn Craved allegiance to breathe Legitimacy to the kingdom that he claimed He sought the hand of Hussein, son of Ali and Fatima Peace upon them until the day of Qiyamah Took his family to Mecca to the home of the Kaaba Birthplace of his father to avoid any drama But Yazid pushed harder The people of Iraq said Please come to Kufa, please come and be our master Hussein wasn't sure if the letters could be trusted He sent a representative, his cousin, Muslim Son of a cure, grandson of Abu Talib Rode fast to Iraq to meet the people who were calling they greeted him at Kufa, yet they cheered and applauded Arms open, he was hoping they'd continue their support If times got tough, cause it would only get tougher The people got together for the son of Mustafa Raising the banner of Labaik on the surface To his face they recounted memories of Hussein Who, as a young man, walked down the alleyways Feeding the hungry, guiding the strays Until those that went out killed the caliph in the masjid Yeah, we missed the son of Ali, please call him today To come and be our leader Muslim wrote a letter to his master Hussein To leave Hajj Leave Mecca and begin to make his way with his family Only Allah knew that Muslim would be dead within days Situations change, no time is the same Yazid knowing this sent a wild beast to tame The callers of Hussein and for fortune and favour from the king He took pleasure in torture and pain And the son of Ziyad had his messengers go out in the streets To proclaim those that failed to obey will be dealt with So Muslim all of a sudden lost thousands of helpers can you imagine this stranger alone? No family or friends far away from his home now All he saw were empty roads and closed doors Roaming the streets when just hours before Many men beside him all ready for war Now Muslims sat in the home of a poor lady Kufa streets are crazy, his son sold him out to the police to detain him 
but more slim fought back The soldiers underestimated this man's attack Couldn't handle the force that Muslim brought upon him So after hours of battle and many dead brothers The chief of police said I guarantee your safety No one will cure you, just come with me quietly Muslim was thirsty, his throat was dry With blood in his mouth, he praised the most high The son of Ziyad didn't guarantee nothing You're gonna die today on the roof of this building Cut off his head and drop his body to the ground And hang the remains in front of his whole town Drowning in tears, Muslims stood exhausted They mocked his appearance Aren't the Hashemites the hardest warriors? But you're shaking from fear He said, I don't cry for me Hussein's on his way here This is a story of torment and grief It's only just begun Hussein's yet to bleed It's just left Mecca Aiming to free the souls of the people And answer their pleas This is a story of torment and grief It's only just begun Hussein's yet to bleed He's just left the Kaaba with his family to bring guidance to those whose souls are diseased This is a story of torment and grief It's only just begun, Hussein's yet to bleed He's just left Mecca trying to find some peace to worship and private and teach This is a story of torment and grief It's only just begun, Hussein's yet to bleed He's just left his mother's grave to save his enemies from the curse of Yazid so as he travels through the dust Hussein knows many men cause of greed and lust Will try to make his journey more dangerous But he has to keep going in Allah is his trust He must challenge the status quo Ayahs in favour of knowledge and prayers over dancing dice players In the distance he sees men approaching Slowly advancing Cautiously coming to ask for an audience Thirsty from walking Check the surroundings One thousand soldiers with two thousand horses Begging for water Hussein can't deny the request so he orders his brothers and helpers to quench his opponent's thirst and this is surely your first if you know what's to come then this is what hurts the sons of Hussein generously dispersing water to animals water to beasts wars on its way now it's greetings of peace as Hussein makes Salah on the ground in the heat soldiers follow but don't allow a retreat the chief of the army doesn't know where to stand his name is Hur translate free man he wants to let Hussein walk away from this land but the fear of Yazid is hard to Withstand. More troops are coming against only a few In the end it's 30,000 against 72 Curfew and Kufa still some true supporters of the master of heaven Pray he makes his way through But this is as far as Hussein could advance Doesn't want to cause blood to be shed He was asked, what is this place? Do you know its name? The story begins as Hussein explains Cannot hear you, brother. Sorry, I mute my microphone. Sorry, through my laptop. Bismillah, uh, Rahim. Thank you, one uh, for mentioning that problem. Uh, thank you, everyone. The Islamic uh, Alresto Islamic Center community for joining our program and your program, actually, and whoever is uh, joining our program throughout the world. May Allah accept your mornings and keep us all in your doors. Mulana uh, Mekir, thank you for joining. Uh, by the way, my name is Omid. For those who don't know me, Mulana uh, Mekir, whenever you're ready, you could start. Uh, everyone, as you know, we will start from. Q&A, so feel free if you have any question, you could unmute yourself or put your question in the chat and we will share with everyone. So I'm gonna make you with that, you could start whenever you're ready. Sorry, you're muted. Oh yeah. There we go, so now my turn muted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Uh, thank you for sharing that video, actually. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to start with a comment. Um, and uh, there was one question that was texted, but I'll start with this comment. Um, there was a uh, kind of related a little bit to that uh, video. Um, there was a program once where uh, there was a, um, a young man and he wanted to recite Noha. And, you know, this is Muharram or uh, maybe it was Arba'in, but it was, you know, Majlis of Azza and Morning. And so this young man, you know, was a little bit hesitant. And so I was, you know, trying to encourage him, like, you know, go ahead and, and, and recite. And he said, you know, I'm not sure if I want or if I should. And I said, you know, if you're doing for the sake of, you know, uh, Abu Abdullah, you're doing for the sake of Imam Hussein, for the sake of Allah, you're, you know, sharing this message. There's so much tawab and blessings. We need to you know, hear more young people, especially in English, you know, doing, you know, different uh, poetry and nohas and things like that. And so he went up and eventually he, he decided to, that he was going to recite something and he did. And um, it was, the, the reactions were twofold. The, the reactions were like, you know, two different uh, groups of people. Um, his style was very much like rap uh, or spoken word. And uh, to me, I thought it sounded beautiful. The content was, you know, very uh, important message that he shared. And um, overall, I thought he did a great job. His presentation was also, you know, very confident, very, uh, you know, um, well put together. And some of the feedback was very negative, you know, and this can really go either way, you know, and I've seen this in different settings. Like sometimes there's an idea in our mind of what mourning or azaw of Imam Hussein must look like. And I urge us to be very mindful and to be, you know, very careful about that because we don't have a hadith that says that this is the only way that, you know, we should mourn for Imam Hussein alayhi salam, or what that looks like in different cultures. And, uh, you know, the, some people that because they weren't able to see the content or able to see a different style, a different culture than what they grew up with, what they were used to, they looked at this in a way that was kind of negative, you know, and Sometimes, you know, just thinking about the implications of this. So that could result in someone, you know, like that young man becoming discouraged, right? Not just discouraged to recite Noha again, but perhaps being so discouraged that maybe he doesn't participate in any majlis anymore, you know? Um, maybe he uh, loses faith and doesn't see his connection to, you know, Islam. Like there's on so many levels, on so many levels, um, there's an impact to that. For, the, for those of you who just joined in, I'll just recap quickly. I'm just talking about a comment. There was a beautiful um, uh, presentation of a uh, song rap uh, about Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And I really appreciate it. And thank you guys for sharing that. And I was sharing about a person who, um, a young man who recited something similar in a majlis gathering uh, of Azza, and the reaction was some people really appreciated Ahsan, mashallah, that's, you know, that's beautiful, that's positive, that's great. Um, and some people reacted, you know, very harshly and negatively saying that, you know, this wasn't the way that you're supposed to mourn. And, and basically, it was culturally something different from what they grew up hearing or uh, being used to and they felt that because of that that the way that they understood that that was pretty much the only way or the right way anything similar may be good but this is definitely very different and, and this is living in the living in America you know in uh, this day and age and it's a different culture than uh, other places than a lot of Muslim countries and lands and so it may look different but that is also you know that beauty of how Islam can manifest and so many different cultures is actually an asset to Muslimin. It's a beauty. It's the reason why Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, you know, and will continue to be, you know, and will overtake many other religions as the, the most popular religion in the world. And the reason for that is simple. 
is because Islam is relevant to everyone's culture. It's not particular to one language or one culture. And that is one of the things that, attra you know, attracts a lot of people. So it was just a very, um, uh, just a, uh, something I thought was interesting, the implications of, you know, if, you know, someone comes and says something negative to this young man and tells him that, you know, this is bad or this is haram or different things like that, that sometimes people say because of their own personal understanding or biases, and uh, that results in someone going away from the religion all, altogether sometimes. It can have very catastrophic um, implications that I think that we don't always consider. Thank you, brother. So again, uh, brothers and sisters, if, if you have, this is a time for Q&A. If you have any questions, unmute yourself uh, and ask your question or, or type in the chat. Uh, I like to call this time open discussion. So if it's a question, it's fine. If it's a comment, that's also fine. A uh, reflection a perspective that you'd like to add to the conversation, I, I would appreciate it. Assalamu alaikum, Maulana. I have another quick question today. Wa alaikum Asante. How are you? Good, how about yourself? Good, good, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. So my quick question was, I, I come across some people who are Shia, but they don't follow um, the 12 words. They tend to take a different route, I think, after Imam Hussein or Imam uh, Zainul Abdin. I do not know what is the, how do we know now? So I had a conversation with one of them recently, and he said, how do we know when it was said, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the lineage of Fatima, the legion of Muhammad will come through Fatima, how do we know that? our lineage of the 12 words is actually the one, not the other ones. What is the answer to that? Um, I think that, you know, I talked about this a little bit yesterday about some of the hadith that mentioned the uh, 12 imams, some of the hadith that mentioned all of the imams by name. Um, some of the hadith that just, that mentioned about the descendants uh, onward from uh, Imam uh, Hussein alayhi salam or from Hazrat Fatima salam alayha. I think the most important important uh, sign is that each Imam has a responsibility also to give direction to the Ummah about the next Imam. And at a time when Imam saw there were after Imam saw there were some. Uh, have, uh, from the point of view of the 12 verse Shias, have gotten a, a distorted or, or wrong uh, understanding of who they should follow next. And the think about the circumstances. Imam Sadiq has 5,000 students, 4,000, 5,000 students. Um, the understanding of who is the next Imam and these teachings, there are many hadith about them, you know, that make this clear. And so it seems that even in those, you know, who uh, are Ismaili or Zaidi, it seems that there isn't a lot of uh, proof that these individuals themselves were calling uh, to Imamat, that they are saying that they are, you know, it was a understanding maybe of the people more so, it seems. Um, and so we have to make sure that we're staying in line with, you know, uh, those traditions that are from, you know, all of the Ahlul Bayt, but also specifically the, the previous Imam. Thank you, Maulana. Thank you, Maulana. So, is it safe to say that in, in this regard, basically, uh, in our in Shia school of thought, uh, the 12 words that we are, the Jafriya school of thought, 
the the flag of imama was passed from one imam to the another imam with the consent of the former imam the incumbent imam while in the other school of thought it seems that it was more of a political and people's opinion and stuff correct that seems that certainly seems to be the case um okay. definitely i i would highlight the choice of the imam is not uh, the choice the choice of who is the imam of the people is not the choice of the imam the imam imam ali is not choosing imam hassan as his imam the choice of imam it has to be appointed by allah and who's carrying out that explanation of what the choice is is for example the the Imam Ali who's saying that, you know, this is... Incumbent Imam. Right, exactly. So we, we just have to, you know, under, make sure we're clear that this is not something that is uh, from a 12 uh, Jafari school of thought point of view. It is not something that is just the whim or the personal perspective of the, the living Imam. Thank you, Maulana. That should help me answer the question. Thank you very much. Jazakallah. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, if you have anything to discuss uh, as a question or if you want to share anything, uh, let us know. If not, uh, Molana, you could start lecture whenever you're ready. Oh. We could wait maybe one more minute if there's any question or sure. if anyone want to share anything with us. Uh, if nobody's asking a question, I just wanted to real quick uh, request that if we could spend some guidance from you or some 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 tutelage from you with regards to the political state of the country, the state of our union, and with the elections coming up, and wanted to know from the Islamic perspective the importance of participating and taking part in the nation that you're living in, in the elections and stuff. If if you could kind of tell us on the Islamic guidelines what are the basically the reasons, the justifications which kind of require us as citizens to take part in, in the country's you know, political system and our participation by voting and stuff. I would really appreciate that. So I have one minute. <laughs> and that's a lot to unpack in one minute. Um, I think that if, it's, if you don't mind, I can so save that question for tomorrow if you're able to. Otherwise, then let me give a, um, a quick brief answer. I think tomorrow would be better, but brevity okay. right now, but we can go elaborate tomorrow if there's time, definitely. Okay, okay. so uh, let me just plant some seeds to think about very quickly. And, uh, and uh, please uh, um, remind me, Brother Omid, uh, tomorrow uh, to start with this question, inshallah. Inshallah, sure, brother. Sure. Um, one is we have a concept of taghut, and what does that mean? I mean, example, Yazid, you know, of, his, of that time. What does that mean for us? Um, we also have a concept of Muslims being the, um, Islam being the solution to the problems of humanity. So if Islam is the solution, that means that Muslims, the practitioners of Islam, have to somehow lead the changes that we want to see in the world, that we want to see in this country. Um, that's another point that's important. And then lastly is a point of uh, benefit, you know. Um, is there a benefit to engaging in this system? And what does that look like? To what extent, you know, does one engage in the system? Um, 
there's different levels of what that might look like as far as a, a role, uh, an official role, um, or support, or um, reaching out for requests, um, a collective role. There's different possibilities. And we have to look at these obviously in the scope of uh, what Islam says and what is uh, for us in our role and what's the most effective thing that we should be uh, doing. And how do we take into consideration, again, looking at the actions uh, of such a government, um, the system which exists, which in many ways is there's systematic injustice. Uh, how do we do anything about that? And is voting, for example, or civic engagement the best solution or what should that look like? There's a couple of things to unpack here. And I like to encourage you to um, you all to really think about maybe um, a couple of these things or, you know, do a little research perhaps and, and then uh, let's continue this conversation in more detail tomorrow, inshallah. Allah <coughs> وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي. <coughs> Yesterday we talked a little bit about touching on the hereafter and death. Um, there's a fearlessness that the companions of Imam Hussein alayhi salam had. I want to take this a little bit of a step further in understanding, uh, especially when we live in a world where death is very much feared. Um, it's definitely for many people seen as an end. And when we look at the traditions and the ahadith for a believer, uh, we look at this certainly as being the beginning. Right. There's a hadith that says that when a believer dies, he awakens. And our perspective is that the afterlife is an eternal life, right? Khalidina fiha abada. And that there is a place of retribution, good and bad. There has to be. We discussed this. But we want to really understand how does someone like Qasim look at as a young man with this deep understanding, enough to not, it's not just a slogan, death to me is sweeter than honey. There's a deep understanding of what that means and what does that sweetness mean? Anything which takes a person closer to Allah in terms of that being their uh, path and their circumstance, then they accept it. We have hadith that we should ask for more life, though, at the same time. And yes, we should do that. And, 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 on the, and at the same time, be willing and ready that if it's our time to leave this world, that we are also able to accept and embrace that. You know, there are manazil in different stages. And the last stage of this world is death. And that's the first stage of the eternal life and the eternal uh, journey. We know that every soul will taste death, and we talked about remembering death a lot. You know, we have the tradition of when you go to a wedding, how should you go? Walk slowly, take your time. And when you go to a funeral, rush. You know, give importance to that, make haste. 
because one reminds you of your eternal afterlife. One reminds you more oftentimes of this world and worldly things. I want to shift and offer a different perspective on to remember death a lot and the day which will be uh, coming out of the day of resurrection, coming out of your graves. And put that into perspective of why the companions of Imam Hussein were welcoming and eager for that moment. Obviously, it's also not just death. They are having an opportunity, an honor, to leave this world as martyrs. When every soul will taste death, it's inevitable to come. Whether that means, you know, a person uh, lives for a very long time and maybe they uh, die away, die of some natural event or natural cause, or if it means that something else happens, if it means that something event transpires, some incident which causes them to leave this world, ultimately that time will come. So if there is this opportunity and they can do so much good for humanity, then of course for these believers, their belief translated into action. And they embrace, you know, that moment and that opportunity. But what, but the other perspective, the other way that I like you to look at this, remembering death a lot is the cause for you to do what? Cherish life. Cherish life itself. Understanding that the hereafter is inevitable and coming, it changes your perspective about the things that you look at as mundane and things that you look at as uh, not so important in this world. Sometimes we look at things like, for example, seeing our siblings, seeing our parents, seeing our children. And we don't think about the smiles on their faces. We don't think about the beauty in them. We don't think about all of the kind moments that we have, the memories that we have with one another, or what things we're going to do, or how long that's going to be, or when that's going to be gone. We don't cherish the moments of life. This idea of remember death a lot puts that spirit intellect in control and puts the in the driver's seat puts the uh, uh, lower soul and the ego in the trunk in the back seat and puts it in a lower place and a person thinks more clearly you hear about instances for example where someone has a bucket list things that they want to do before they leave this world. Or sometimes these are things that a person thinks about more if they, if they believe, you know, that the, the doctor told them that they have such and such amount of months in this world. And oftentimes at those times we, re, we remember and we cherish. But the reality is, is that is that moment only guaranteed for that person who, who believes that uh, uh, the afterlife is very close? Or as it mentions, closer than the juggler vein? Is that only for that person? Remember death a lot means remember it even if you're not that person. You haven't gotten some uh, 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 diagnosis or given some a span of time that you will be in this world. You don't know. So remember death a lot is actually an apparatus to help us to nurture the life that we have in this world. Is there any promise that, oh, people who pass away are people who are old in age only? Are there no young people who have left this world?
And there are so many. What makes us so confident that we don't think that it is our turn maybe near? It says when people ask about the afterlife, tell them maybe it's near. Maybe the hour is near. What do you know? Maybe it is close. And so the idea that sometimes people have, and I've heard this concept, oh, don't, Islam, they talk too much about death. I want to be happy. I want to live a, a happy life and think positive thoughts. And I don't want to think about death. But is that really a positive thought? Is it? Or is it a path into negligence? A path of forgetfulness, a path of lack of responsibility. When there's a hadith that someone comes and asks about this purpose of death and why the time is not known for in individuals, that most people don't know when that time is going to come. Even the physician that comes and says that this is the time, it's, that's not a guarantee. I've, I've been on more than one occasion in a hospital visiting someone that supposedly had days or weeks and they lived much longer. It's not up to anyone but Allah at the end of the day. And anyway, in the hadith, it's explaining that that state of not knowing when the time is, that is actually by design to help us to be prepared. Help us to be prepared. That way that people prepare when they know, they should prepare when they don't know. This is the, the meaning of this remember death a lot. Meaning remember it even at a time when you don't think that it is your time. Remember it even then. This, these nights of uh, uh, Ashura, the nights of Muharram and the remembrance of the events of Ashura, these days of remembering Karbala, these are moments to reflect on how precious I have, I, uh, 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 I, what I have in my hands is. How precious is the gifts that God has given to me, the abilities that he has given to me, the status that he has given to me, the bounties that he has given to me. How precious are the family that he has given to me. Think about the moments of cherishing life in Karbala. Parents burying children. Brothers burying brothers. Friends burying each other. Witnessing martyrdom. Yes, what we see in Karbala is life. The essence of life, the haqiqa of life, the reality of life, of understanding the precious moments. Every word is you hung on to. Is this the last word? Is this the last goodbye? Is this the last look? How much do we not value our life, the people in our life, the benefits that God has given us? We don't even think about them. In fact, we complain about them. Remember death a lot so that you can cherish this world cherish this life.
And that is why this, the honor of living a noble life is so valuable to one whose last moments will be the moments of a martyr. It becomes the epitome of what a beautiful life is. To have lived and to live in this way. I talked about, we talked about the beliefs and how we must have conviction in those beliefs. In God, the oneness of God, in divine justice, in the prophethood of the prophets, in the imamat, and in the day of judgment, in the afterlife. These are part of our belief system. I want to take a look at something um, when we're looking at the afterlife. And I like to look at this through the example of a, uh, a uh, neurosurgeon. And you can Google and, and look him up. Uh, Dr. Alexander. He was a neurosurgeon for a quarter of a century. Uh, expert in his profession from Harvard, prestigious university. In his opinion, there was no afterlife. And when people said things about what they saw or thought they saw in near-death encounters and things like that, they he would say these are hallucinations. So like the events which we hear about of uh, 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 the seeing the, uh, uh, the prophet or in that moments of transition, the Ahl al-Bayt when some of them were getting ready, going to Shahadat and crossing into that transition, he would refer to those as hallucinations. He would say, these are just hallucinations. And ultimately, he had a severe near-death experience, which he went into a coma. When he goes into this coma, for, uh, I forget exactly the period of time, but he his, uh, uh, was basically, he had no uh, consciousness. His uh, neocortex was non-functioning. He had been in a coma, a prolonged coma. And, but he has this rich audio, visual, tangible experience, this uh, ultra reality rich experience that he's narrating and talking about, which from a scientific point of view or what we consider science, which we need to qualify but from a scientific point of view, this would not be possible, right? These, if these are just mere hallucinations. He ends up writing a book called uh, Proof of Heaven. And he talks about some of the things which he saw, which he experienced. And it's, it's definitely interesting. There's a couple of things that I want to take from this and, and connect to. One is that, as we talked about also confidence, 
I've shared this with believers where sometimes, or they have read this on their own and marveled at this as, wow, this is amazing. This is proof of the afterlife. And I find that fascinating that a lot of times we are very willing and ready to accept the word of scientist, quote unquote scientist, despite having a tremendous amount of hadith and narrations that speak on this issue. How much hadith do we have that talks about the afterlife? What that looks like? What it will be like? What the experiences some of them will be like? And for some people to need the validation of someone like Dr. Alexander because he went to Harvard to confirm something that Imam Ali salam had already told him was something that Rasulullah had already mentioned. That to me is a deficiency in perspective and confidence in religion. We have enough intellectual proof and reasoning as we mentioned and also textual proof why there has to be an afterlife so for someone to approach in a way where they are not able to see this but they they're able to understand only when this doctor so-and-so tells them that's a deficiency in us a uh, inferiority complex where we can embrace the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt. So, so no wonder we'll struggle when it comes to the practice of religion. Are we looking for validation from outside? Someone who's not Muslim to make me feel the confidence in my religion? The other aspect that we have to think about is what does it mean when we say science? What does this science mean? The views of science means hypotheses, theories, which we can test and come to some conclusion about. Measurable tests, which we can prove this or that. It's a theory that we need to be able to measure and prove. So these tangible, measurable, uh, uh, parameters are what defines that this is a part of science. Or enough that it becomes a scientific proof. We have to understand that Islam has a different view than saying some things are, for example, uh, uh, secular and then other things are religion. And embracing this view is actually problematic for us. Why? Imagine that the Imam of the time comes, Imam Mahdi, Ajalallah Ta'ala Farajum Sharif. Will we say that, Ya Imam, you have the answers to our religion? Tell us the, the, the uh, best of tafsir, what is the right fiqh about things, the right uh, common rulings? and jurisprudence, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to the secular or, or uh, academic sciences, we will refer to someone else. And ignore the views of what the Imam is saying. We have to understand that from an Islamic standpoint, there is no, there is no secular. There's just knowledge, all of it. Allah doesn't have religious knowledge and not have secular knowledge, for example. Imam Sadiq with his thousands of students, as we mentioned. Imam Sadiq was teaching fiqh the jurisprudence, he was teaching the principles of jurisprudence, he was teaching tafsir, he was teaching irfan, he was teaching mysticism, he was also teaching medicine, 
He was also teaching mathematics. He was also teaching chemistry. He didn't look at, oh, these are the secular things. No, this is just all knowledge. It's all under one umbrella. The sooner we begin to appreciate and understand that, the more we can appreciate the things that Islam has said about all of this knowledge. Because you run into a serious problem with this, this definition or this quote-unquote secular definition. It means that there will be things in this world which we cannot measure. Right? Just like this, this neurosurgeon with 25 years of experience in his craft understanding the ins and outs of it very much. Yet, he can't truly have an opinion on the soul because he doesn't have a means to measure and test the soul. He can't truly have an opinion on Jannah and Jahannam and heaven and hell if he doesn't have a true way to test those things or God, or so on and so forth. The entire metaphysical world becomes a place where people who accept this definition and don't have any source of information that they consider reliable about the metaphysical world, they don't have answers. That's, some of them say, well, then I'll be atheist. I won't believe in anything because I don't have any way to theory, measure, test, prove, and for it to be called a science. But for us, the science is much broader than that. And so we consider the science of the creation of the universe. We consider those metaphysical traditions that talk about the nature of God, that talk about the afterlife, that talk about the path to the afterlife. Things which this person couldn't believe. And we have two kinds of knowledge. We have ilm, which we call husuli. This is acquired knowledge. You go through a process, you read, you learn, you go to school, you acquire the knowledge over time. You learn it. Then you have naduri, which is, means that there is no process of learning that has to take place. No. The uh, uh, knowledge of ghayb, of the, the uh, knowledge of the unseen of the Ahl al-Bayt. Imam Ali alayhi salam explains that if we will this, then Allah gives us this knowledge. And we know, like, it's almost like there's no medium. In, in, uh, in philosophy, it's, it's called the hudur of the ma'loom and the la'alim. So between the, the presence of the intelligible, that which is known is in the immediate presence of that of the one who knows. So the reality and existence of what is known and the one who knows, there's no space between them and he knows. He is connected to that knowledge immediately instantaneously and that that immediate kind of experience of knowing and so for this person he had to have the immediate experience of knowledge to know and come to this conclusion and reality he wasn't looking at traditions of imam and al bayt some of the things that he mentions are are, are, are interesting and he talks about how communication in the realms that he saw, different realms, the communication was telepathic, is the way that he describes it. And this is akin to the idea of the same idea in that space in the realm, this higher spiritual realm, the communication can be direct. It doesn't have to be absolutely with the way that we communicate with our vocal words and so on and so forth now. 
saying all this to say and to emphasize that this deeper understanding of the metaphysical world is the reason why the companions of Imam Hussein believed that death was sweeter than honey. They saw much greater. They saw beauty in. They saw this connection. They weren't thinking this is the end. This is just a part of the, the overall journey. One of the manazil, one of the one of the stages. In the words of Prophet Isa alayhi salam, this world to that world is just a bridge. This world is just a connection to get you to the next point. You cross over a bridge, that's it. And we see this in the differences of the two camps. You look at the camp of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, their perspective, their worldview, they spend their night reciting Quran, reciting the uh, night prayer. They spend their night in worship and remembrance of Allah. But think about those who feel that they are going to live forever. They're not concerned about that afterlife and what's coming. The other camp of Yazid. They're worried about filling their bellies. They're worried about what prize and money they'll have. They're worried about, about looting, stealing property. They're worried about recognition. They're worried about more sleep. There's a distinct difference. When Imam Hussein السلام, when he wants to go to uh, so many of his companions have been killed, he wants to give an opportunity to this army of Yazid. You know, even if you are so harsh even if you are so uh, 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 harsh and hard-hearted to the extent where you don't feel anything and you don't care about anything and you're so uh, avaricious just for dunya, just for uh, 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 material things, Even if you are at that point, you usually have some very soft spot. That an infant, that a small child or infant, at least this will be someone where you can care for. The cry of an infant child, maybe let him have some water. When Imam Hussein is calling, he's saying, is there anyone to defend the haram of Rasulullah? Is there anyone who knows Allah? Do you understand the reward of being a helper of the Ahl al-Bayt? And they're so harsh, they don't care. He says, let me take my son. Maybe they'll give, maybe they, maybe they will care about a six-month-old infant. Maybe they will have the slightest remorse. In the moment when it says that the, they became two groups and some said, you know, maybe give a little water. What's the big deal? We already have them outnumbered. This is when they command Harmala to shoot with the arrow that is used to kill a much bigger and slaughter a camel, to use that arrow to pierce the tender 
small little neck of the infant Ali Asghar. The Imam has blood from this child whose throat was parched, who was thirsty, who would have to quench his thirst from the fountain of Keltha. He had to go to Bibi Zainab. And this is one of the it says he throws this blood towards the sky. Imam Baqir alayhi salam says, not even a drop. Imam Baqir, the blood of Ali Askar came back down to the ground. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'oon Siya'lamu lalladheena zalamu Ayyum unqalabin yanqalabun Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Thank you, Jazakallah Allah, thanks a lot Brothers, uh, this is a time for let me uh, if there's any volunteer, please let us know. Unmute yourself and do the let me for Sabah. Thank you. But then, inshallah, if, if there's no one, I can, inshallah, if I do one, I can say no one, inshallah. Thank you, Brother Hassan. Thank you. Thank you so much. In any language that works, it's all sabab. Anyone who do let me, inshallah, it will be accepted by Allah. In any language. Thank you, Brother. Inshallah. Thank you. <clears throat> Allow me just a moment to first mute myself. Sure, take your Can time. you guys hear me? Okay, good. How yes, you? yes, Brother. Yes. Okay. So. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Please say the salawat, inshallah. Allah. 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 Dashta Karbala, Zalzale Metha, Dashta Karbala, Kapune Laga, Arsha Kibriya, Gunjiti Kijab, Hatta Rafsada, Vamusi Bata, Kushna Shod Hussein, Vamusi Bata, Kushna Shod Hussein, O Piti Titi Sar. Zainab-e Azim, roti thi raba, baith kar kahi, thar thar aapti thi, dasht ki zami, waa musibata, kushta shod hussain, waa musibata, kushta shod hussain, ek makam par, chand bhi biya, sar khule huye, Zara na tawab Har zaban par na la fuga Wa musibata Kushta shod hussain Wa musibata Kushta shod hussain Har ek marid idhar Tap me mubtila Farsh khaak par Kaapta hua, kaun le khabar, kaun de dawa, wa musibata, kushta shod hussain, wa musibata, kushta shod hussain, a toot kar gira, deen ka satoon, dasht me baha, Mustafa ka khun, inkalab e waq, tujh ko kya kahun? Wa musibata, kushta shod hussain, 
वहां मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन नंगे सर हरम पेशे अहल सर नंगे सर हरम पेशे अहल सर बिजलिया गिरी अहल बैत पर तू ही अजल पर रहम कर वहा मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन वहा मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन हद से बढ़ गया जुल्म अहल शाम आग लग गई जल गए खयाम कौन रोकता जा चुके इमाम वहा मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन वहा मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन रात आ गई जैन बे अजीम आप ही उठे अब कोई नहीं गिर के अलमदार सो गया कहीं वहा मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन वहा मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन अरे कौन चुप करे अब सकी न को कौन ये कहे बीबी अब न रो रोती जाती है लोगो क्या करो कुछ करो वहा मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन वहा मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन अरे बे कफन रहा लाश शाह दीन रो रही है माँ तरह आसतीन रोको अब कलाम शाहिद अजीम वहा मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन वहा मुसीबत कुछ न शोध हुसैन वाह मोहम्मद थैंक यू सो मच फिर Is there any other volunteer for let me out feel free to unmute yourself If not uh, from the last few years we had the blessing together in person together and mourn for Imam Hussein and uh, Muharram in person. To this year, as you know, it's different. But uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, we should uh, be thankful from Allah for Allah to give us this opportunity to gather online. Uh, I had some recordings from a few. I think it was two years ago. It's short video. I will play that, and after that, we will recite the Yorat Barsa. Hey <laughs> 
Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. May Allah accept your mornings or everyone. Uh, Brother Hassan, Haji Hassan, if you are here, uh, could you uh, recite uh, Ziyad Warisa? Or if there is anyone volunteer to uh, recite Ziyad Warisa, uh, definitely we prefer the live uh, speaker. If not, uh, Haji Hassan could do the recording. Uh, brother, uh, uh, go ahead uh, and then uh, host, you are the host. Oh, sorry. Uh, I need to, you know, uh, get this one going. Yes, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, right there. Jazakallah. And then uh, go ahead. <laughs> ومعتمدي ورجاي ذخري وذخيرتي في آخرتي ودنياي الإمام الحسين عليه سلام الله زيارة مني ونيابة عن والدي وعن إخواني وأخواتي وعن جميع المؤمنين والمؤمنات قربتان إلى الله تعالى السلام عليك يا وارث آدم صفوة الله السلام عليك يا وارث نوح السلام عليك يا وارث إبراهيم خليل الله السلام عليك يا وارث موسى كليم الله السلام عليك عيسى روح الله السلام عليك يا وارث محمد حبيب الله السلام عليك يا وارث أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام ولي الله السلام عليك يا ابن محمد المصطفى السلام عليك يا ابن علي المرتضى السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء 
السلام عليك يا ابن خديجة الكبرى السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثاره والوتر الموتور أشهد أنك قد أقمت الصلاة وآتيت الزكاة وأمرت بالمعروف ونهيت عن المنكر وأطعت الله ورسوله حتى أتاك اليقين فلعن الله أمة قتلت ولعن الله أمة ولعن الله أمة سمعت بذلك فرضيت به يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله أشهد أنك كنت نورا في الأصلاب الشامخة والأرحام المطهرة لم تنجسك الجاهلية بأنجاسها ولم تلبسك من مدلهمات ثيابها وأشهد أنك من دعائم الدين وأركان المؤمنين وأشهد أنك الإمام البر التقي الرضي الزكي الهادي المهدي وأشهد أن الأئمة من ولدك كلمة التقوى وأعلام الهدى والعروة الوثقى والحجة على أهل الدنيا وأشهد الله وملائكته وأنبياءه ورسله أني بكم مؤمن وبإيابكم موقن بشرائع ديني وخواتيم عملي وقلبي لقلبكم سيل وأمري لأمركم متبع صلوات الله عليكم وعلى أرواحكم وعلى أجسادكم وعلى أجسامكم وعلى شاهدكم وعلى غائبكم وعلى ظاهركم وعلى باطنكم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الرحمن الرحيم يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مغلم الغلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك وعلى محمد الحسين في الدنيا والآخرة الله يا حميد بحق محمد يا علي بحق علي يا فاتر بحق فاتمة 
يا محسن وحق الحسن يا قديم الأحسان بحق الحسين اللهم عجل وليك الفرج اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Brother Hassan and Brother Omar, if you have uh, if you have to say anything, let us know. Jazakallah, Brother uh, Omid, with the soul of all the mu'min and mu'minat, and all those loved ones who passed away near and far, and all those uh, people who are facing the calamity around the world, and especially in this country, and all loved ones from the masjid, and then uh, friends and relatives who passed away, who are facing, facing the uh, sickness in, you know, coronavirus or any other sickness. 